uh, roll call. Okay, I am officially recording. And it is Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the University Hill Commercial Area Management Commission meeting. Uh, that will call roll. Farrell Liguori. Here. Trent Bush. Here. Ed Rockwell. Here. Andrew Shoemaker. I think he will be joining us later. And I will hand it back over to our chair for the procedural items. Okay. Um, the minutes um, from the November 8th meeting and our, uh, and our retreat. Did everyone have an opportunity to read through? Does anyone have any changes? No, just on the, I'm curious, I'm not, the, the dates, the term dates. But those, wait, Ted, did you say those are now correct? I think they're now correct in the printout that we mm -hmm. received here today. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Yeah. I think online it was still much better. Right. Sound okay on the website. Oh. I thought I saw it. Twenty twenty, but I'll, I'll double check. Way, yeah, I think mine said twenty twenty six. Still, I think yours did say twenty twenty six. On the on the online double, double check. packet. Okay, oh. that was the only that was the only comment I had. Okay, no other comments. You can stay until twenty twenty six if you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe things have happened. Does anybody want to? Move to accept the minute. I move to accept the minutes as presented. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to public participation. Do we have any members from the public other than Jake and Matt? Um, all staff. Justin. Okay. And Justin is on. And staff. Justin is also. Okay, no, uh, no public participation, like consent agenda. Moving along, does anyone have any questions um, on the consent agenda? Okay. Um, matters from staff. All right. Chris, you're up. We've got an official meeting today. I'm gonna share my screen from my computer here, once I get, I'm just gonna give you all a preview of the community vitality work plan for 2023, specifically as it applies to our district vitality work area and um, the University Health District. So let me get my screen up, go. All right, Let's see, I, there we go. So we are using Smartsheets platform uh, to manage all of the work plan in the department. And the city is also using this platform. It's similar to like monday.com, uh, just good project management software that can interconnect with um, uh, uh, other departments and we can see in real time where folks are at in their project planning. And so this is a summary of all of the items on the district vitality work plan. And I just wanted to highlight for 2023, um, uh, work plan items that are going to have uh, um, uh, relevance for the Hill area. Of course, we're continuing the EcoPass program, and Lane is the lead on that, and making sure that the program is running effectively and efficiently. Um, no anticipated change to the program, but uh, just ongoing management of that. Um, we are doing some work um, on exploring other TDM possibilities, not just for the University Hill area, but other uh, districts that we manage through partners like Commutify to explore other ways. How do we encourage folks to access our special places um, and encourage them to use other modes of transportation? So um, we are looking into things like uh, TDM wallets. Uh, these are this is virtual wallet that has resources uh, available to users to uh, explore other options. So more um, uh, information to come on that, we'll continue to work with B-Cycle. Um, we do have the, the B-Cycle station on the hill um, and looking to expand that program and partnership with them. Um, and let's see, uh, for UGIB specifically, um, as we discussed at the retreat, uh, we have it in our work plan item for this year to re 
engage the revitalization, revitalization working group or the commercial side. So all the work that was done in 2014, 2015, bring that back up again. And I am going to share the good news. We just heard today that ULI has awarded us the grant for our, our TAP uh, work. So we just found it today. And so very excited to be able to, to lead that into um, our work plan for 2023. Um, hopefully uh, folks may be able to see the the new landscaping uh, flower beds and, and tree planter wells that have gone in. So we'll be working in the spring to get those um, uh, landscaped and looking nice. Um, let's see, moving down. Uh, we also have identified ARPA dollars uh, and council is provided uh, tentative approval of those dollars. It's gonna be part of our adjustment to base in February for a number of um, elements that will have impacts on the hill. We have more resources for outdoor dining. We're anticipating many more restaurants um, in downtown and possibly University Hill applying for um, more expansions and parking spaces for outdoor dining. Um, we have dollars identified for commercial area activations. We're specifically targeting um, revitalization activity um, with our, our special events team. Uh, for the Hill area and places in the downtown that are not performing as well as we would have anticipated uh, post-COVID um, compared to other parts of the city. And so the Hill is an area where we're targeting uh, those resources for more activation uh, to bring more people uh, and more economic activity. Um, we are continuing to support uh, the Hill Boulder and uh, Jake is here with us. We have, uh, we, last year we provided them an additional $10,000 beyond what we had traditionally been providing. So up to $20,000 a year to support uh, Jake's work um, with the Merchants Association. So that's continuing in 2023. Is that, is the ARPA funding tied to the website? Yeah, that's all interconnected. Okay. Um, we know that uh, we've had challenges in, in recruiting for not just this commission, but uh, um, Boulder Junction specifically. So we're going to continue to work to develop this group and, and hopefully attract um, good uh, commission members for folks who are rotating off. Um, so that's I think part I have somebody. Our... Okay. Yeah, I, yeah there, there's some names out there I think everyone's really excited about. So, um, and also uh, you're going to hear some more today from Teresa about some district petitions. We have a number of properties um, that we're looking at um, uh, petitioning into not just Camp C, but also Boulder Junction. Um, we've mentioned in the past that part of the Pleasant Street parking lot was never in the district. And now that it's no longer owned by the city or the district, uh, we need to get that parcel in. And so Teresa is about to share some more information about that process because it's, it's underway now. Um, and we'll be working with Jennifer Pinsono in the city manager's office on the update to the economic sustainability strategy. And the Hill, of course, is a very important uh, commercial district and in our broader economic vitality conversations. So we'll want to make sure that uh, we're, we're including the Hill in those conversations as well. Um, similarly, we have our, our work with the CU Real Estate Center on the development of an affordable commercial uh, pilot program. Uh, right now, we have some resources identified in downtown in the Cajun budget for some affordable commercial pilot projects. We're working with a team of students at CU that are helping to develop um, uh, some proposals for us to consider um, how to use those resources based on their research of other cities that have affordable commercial programs. And so uh, presuming that we are successful with those pilots, uh, those are things that could um, have impacts and, and possibilities for them. The hill commercial area in the future as well. So that is the um, really high level roll up. We have, of course, other things going on in our parking and access um, uh, work area. You've heard a lot about AMPS and that work is continuing with our performance based pricing and neighborhood um, access management. But I really wanted to hone in on, on what we're anticipating right now, specifically for the hill um, in our work plan as it currently stands. Any questions uh, from the commissions, commissioners on our anticipated work plan at this point? No, I, I, I have a question. I'm not sure where to plug it in, but the work that, that's being done at the intersection of college and the sewer line. And yes. 13th 
trajectory. And if that work is the reason that most of the um, pedestrian lighting in the commercial district is not working. That is good to know. I, I, that's the first I heard. I was going to walk, previously I walked around and uploaded the picture, um, but there are a lot of lights out up there. Uh, and, and I thought maybe it was, and, and it's been constant um, over the past year, I would say. Um, but I wasn't sure whether Excel was in, in that big pit um, on college or uh, what the work was related to. All right, I'll ask Lane to make note of that issue and make sure that we can get that. I mean, I can, I'll be up there tomorrow night and I can go around, but. That's the last night, it was totally dark. I thought there was totally a power dark. Dark. Yeah, no, that's the way. And when I was there over the summer, I there were 18 lights out in the district. Yeah. All right, <laughs> it's the entire corner. It's the entire it's intersection. The entire corner, but it's also down 13th, down 13th Street, Street, yeah, all the way down 13th Street. Yeah. The old lights are working. Um, I don't know if you noticed the other night when I was up there, the old fixtures, um, a couple of those are working, but it seemed that almost all of the new fixtures were not working. And this is um, not the first time. Okay. So um, we'll work with Blaine to make sure we can get a status update on why and what the plan is. Maybe there is a planned outage for the construction that we don't that we don't know about right now, unless Lane, you have any additional but particularly. Um, before they dug the hole, that intersection. Um, I think two of the four lights in that intersection were not working. And that's, uh, for somebody who drives up there at night, it's a little scary with all the pedestrians sure. and not being able to see properly. I mean, it's a pretty big safety issue out there. All right, well, thanks for that heads up. And, and please I'll, I'll go around and, to, and, and do the inquire folder thing yeah. again. Okay, so you did do that and you haven't gotten any response? Um, I've done it twice before. I did not do it um, on uh, New Year's Eve. And were you receiving responses? Um, the first time, no. The second time, uh, yes. Okay. And and some flights were repaired. Got it. I don't know why they keep, they, it's pretty, it seems very regular that they're, that they're out. Interesting. I don't know if you noticed that at night, but just just this, just recently. I mean, I love the lights. Just want to, um, right. That's what they're there for. All right. Well, thanks for that. Because yeah, certainly, um, Inquire Boulder is a great place to for anybody. Yeah. If you if you're hearing those types of issues, certainly recommend the use of the app to get uh, the most prompt action. But we will certainly. Um, take this concern back and so we can do that, get the lights working. All right. Um, well, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Teresa to talk about um, the 2023 budget. And there was a request at the retreat that we have a regular budget update at our meetings. And so we're working on that. Um, and Teresa has um, some items for discussion. Yeah, um, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of specific questions that did come up um, during the retreat regarding the investments that we have um, with the sale of the Pleasant Street lot. So I did confirm with our um, assistant controller of the city that we are a part of a $400 million investment pool. And um, so we are being, we were receiving that pooled investment interest um, into the huge fund. And so, yeah, so that's all going um, really well. Um, our, investment advisors, insight investments. Um, right now, the year-to-date return is 1.16%, but I was given a big caveat that there's a lot that's baked into that. Um, so it's not a direct percent return, but it is being managed in a very prudent, professional manner to make sure that we, you did, are receiving the benefit of that investment um, as it sits and we're working towards clients to use it. Um, in addition, we are in the process of pulling together a report um, that we're able to bring to you all 
um, on a very consistent basis. So every time that we meet as commission, um, my proposal to you all is to be able to bring in an up-to-date, kind of year-to-date look of where we stand today, how it compares to the budget of our operating expenses, personnel expenses, where we stand with our CIP dollars, as well as the revenue that we've received, um, to be able to give that snapshot at each meeting. And that way we're not dependent on uh, a defined time in June when the budget comes together. So um, that's our proposal to you, if that's um, appropriate in your minds as uh, giving you context for the budget. Yeah, I mean, from my standpoint, that makes a lot of sense to be seeing where we are month to month. That would be great. It's it's definitely an improvement um, from where we've been. So, so we'll look to start that um, in our March meeting, um, and that way we've got hopefully by then we'll be able to see the close out of twenty twenty two to kind of get a sense of where we ended, and then um, the first couple months here in the new year. And then we'll is it possible to look at a comparison with two thousand nineteen, just in terms of we used to receive um, a sales tax report um, for the district, what the district is generating on a month monthly basis. And um, I think that helps us also focus on the health of the businesses with the sales tax revenue and the admission tax revenue that the district is generating, especially going forward when the Hill Hotel comes online. And I know that we won't be receiving the sales tax revenue into the district for quite some time, right? That's going well, it, yeah, that doesn't come. Right. I mean, no. not yet, but just the sales tax revenue as an end, so it's certainly it's sales as an indicator of the health of the, the commercial district that makes sense. And we do, and, and the finance department does provide that that information. It is available. It's just a matter of just being sure that it gets to your inbox, your inboxes, because that is public information that is really is it by. Okay. Bye, month. And and so I can probably try to district if it's appropriate. I can look with Joel and see if we can include that in the report that I. Or sent. even if just an initial email goes out with a link, we can kind of check into that um, on a regular basis um, where to find it. So we're not. Yeah, we get those reports too. So if, if it's really easy for us, then I don't see why we wouldn't be. Because it would be great to to, to see sales tax revenue go up mm -hmm. after that hotel. Um, goes in and see what if the intended impact is you know, less yes, being realized. That would be great. Great. We'll make that All right. Anything else on budget? No, I think just the revenue from maybe a 2019 to 2022 comparison for the parking revenue. I know that we've had um, the loss of the of the Pleasant Street lot, but I just think um, having a little more data to to look at when we move into 2023 would be great to see how far down we've gone. We can celebrate the ups. Hopefully, as more people are coming into the district. I do know I just looked today, 14th Street produced about $30,000 more in 2022 than it did in 2021, um, which is we've seen, well, parking rates went up by a quarter per hour. Um, and um, we've seen parking behavior um, returning across all of our managed districts. Right, because CU was kind of hybrid that first part of 2021 exactly. as well, so. Great, and we are, you know, for the department, these are numbers that we look at, not just for one specific area, but we are working on a quarterly report. Um, and that might, might be it. some of these things. A there's a the, place there's the, for that to Right, come so out. there's the district fund that we wanna manage, you know, and make sure that we're reporting out to you all as the stewards of the, of the um, representatives that are in charge of keeping track and making sure that we're you're being prudent and thoughtful in the use of those dollars. And then there's the broader work that we do that you all are interested in, in your roles in the community and in the commercial district that we monitor for all, for all of our program. So um, 
we might end up separating the two because I we want to make sure that we're not creating just a you did or you can't see specific work sure. product um, that uh, we're going to want to make sure that we're thinking about the overall operation. But uh, I think that just for district information, I did receive an email that um, a planned expansion from Illegal Pete's into Albums on the Hill is not going to happen because of, I think, landlord tenant improvements, upgrades that need to happen for, I think, them to be. Mm -hmm excited to to move into that space so that's disappointing because that would have been a very um easy expansion to uh, bring more uh bring more to the hill sad uh, maybe go up upstairs downstairs uh, I think upstairs, maybe Jake can talk a little more, but they were planning on taking over that space okay. and maybe creating a, um, a, a little, a smaller music it's venue good. inside there. So, and Jake, if I, yeah, I, spoke, yeah, yeah. Um, I can hop in on that. Uh, I got an email from, can you guys all hear me? Okay. Yeah. I got an email from, uh, the owner, founder, Pete Turner, um, in response to a, an outreach about the album space. And he said, the hill is zoned separately from the rest of Boulder and is significantly more restrictive. We've determined that we're unable to pursue the expansion at this time, unless the city of Boulder levels the playing field for businesses on the hill. Um, so I think right, a so sense I, that, you know, it's, it's hard to get the relevant permits. Sounds like they were maybe anticipating a more of a nightlife entertainment function. That all right. Permit. I thought it was Gary Cook not wanting to do tenant improvements, but it is all about licensing. Yeah, it was about the desire to have it be a live music space with alcohol and the concerns about permits for that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, that will be part of the conversation um, for our ULA uh, tap work. Um, before we get to, to Jake on your other Hill updates, I want to pass it over to Teresa to walk through our process for petitioning in the, the Hill Hotel parcel that was part of the Foreign Pleasant Street Club. Yep. As Chris mentioned, we, we just have a parcel that we need that currently is outside of the UGIT boundary. Um, so to clean up a lot of things, especially for the county assessor and looking at the town's tax implications for the Hill Hotel as a whole. And um, the Hill's been a great or the Hill Hotel partners have been a great partner um, and come to the table and, and stated that they're willing to uh, petition into the district. And so again, it will right now as it stands, that parcel is actually sitting outside of the district and so it has a different tax rate so it will help uh, bring just a lot of continuity to a number of entities um, and so right now we're in the process of just putting that petition together it's a fairly simple straightforward document explaining the interest um, and intention of the hill hotel partners to petition into the district um, staff will be working behind the scenes to gather database information for all of the electors and the different um, property owners within the district just as a notice will go out to each of them. And then in our March meeting, we'll have a public hearing uh, where we'll consider the petition and get any public comment or feedback on that. And then from you all, the commissioners will provide a recommendation to city council to either accept or deny that petition for inclusion. Um, then it will go to city council on their consent agenda to formalize the ordinance that will allow the property into the district boundaries. And then we'll take it back, have it recorded, um, updated through our GIS folks and through the counties um, so that it will become um, a part formally of the UGID boundaries. So at this point, we'll be working to get that noticing out, um, get that petition fully signed, um, and then we'll look forward to coming back to you in March um, for that public hearing. Was it the whole thing goes out? It was just part of it? It's just one part. part. Just, just a lot of part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is like the... So does that... Um... All right, and, and I misspoke, sorry, about the sales tax. It's, it's more about the mill levy the property tax for the property tax 
and that would then um, be part of the district. That's how that participates in the district. Exactly. If we were not successful in petitioning this parcel in, then it um, means that on a portion of the Hill Hotel property, you know, their their total okay. building, they will be taxed lower on a portion of it. So it really just means it translates into a, uh, it's not a significant amount of money, but it adds up right. over time. Um, or well, it makes sense. Yeah. So the action item for us as commissioners is to just um, create a recommendation for city council. And is there a deadline that that letter happens? We'll do it formally at the meeting with a formal vote, and that'll be recorded uh, as okay. part of the process, and then it will be ready for, for uh, council. Okay, great. So presuming that you all vote to accept the petition. <laughs> all right, great. Uh, Thank you for that. I read it, tell us in the details. I love it. I know, I read that in the packet and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, moving forward. Jake, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we'd love to hear your updates. Great, um, yeah, so I've got kind of a lot today. I will try to go slow. Feel free to jump in with any questions. I'm gonna share my screen here. No, I'm not. Looks like okay. I cannot do that. We can help you um, in just a moment. Okay. <laughs> Now you should be able to share your screen. All righty. Let's see. It's thinking about it. Um, All right, it's not working. I'm just gonna, I'll send this to everyone after. Um, it's just a Word document. Um, so we've got some updates on the district. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple businesses are completely moved out now. Boss Lady Pizza, Rosenberg's, Sherry's, and Little Piece of My Heart. Um, Boss Lady Pizza is the only one that I was able to do uh, kind of full outreach with. Um, they. She mentioned a rent hike from the landlord as the number one reason they left. Uh, number two reason being safety concerns for the employees, um, specifically at night surrounding homelessness on the hill. Um, Rosenberg's Sherry's just sounds like it wasn't as profitable as they wanted it to be. A uh, little piece of my heart, I didn't really get a clear, uh, clear reason on that one, but they have other locations in the state. Uh, we do have a new business coming in, the Ginger Pig, started at Rayback 2016. Um, they have a location in Denver, and they'll be moving into the La Choza spot right next to uh, Cafe Ion. Um, and then I do know that people are moving into the In Is Free space, but I do not know who, uh, but I saw furniture being moved in there today. So hopefully that's exciting. <laughs> Uh, Cheryl already mentioned, we talked about illegal Pete's not expanding. Uh, and then I do want to bring up some Hill businesses have been frustrated with the winter construction that's been going on that's already been talked about. Um, there was kind of some stuff going around on social media about from the Hill businesses about this being a kind of crunch time end of year for businesses and that they were pretty unsatisfied with the pedestrian access and the the kind of lack of signage around these construction projects. Um, but I will add the caveat that most Hill businesses are closed during the CU winter break. Um, so those are district updates. Uh, I'll give a few updates about the Hill Boulder, our organization. So we just launched our new website, same URL, thehillboulder.com. Uh, we got help from downtown Boulder and ARPA funds from the city. That was super great. Uh, we're using the City Light platform, which is what downtown Boulder uses. Really good for um, district maps and kind of wayfinding. Uh, 
So we're excited for that. We think it's going to be good, especially when the hotels come, going to be really good for kind of, uh, you know, getting tourists acclimated to the hill and understand what, what there is to offer for them. Um, along with that, we're doing an illustrated map. We've partnered with a CU environmental design student. Uh, we've got a, so she's almost done with that. Uh, and we will have it on our website, on social media and printed at, uh, and hopefully available at the Visit Boulder, uh, St. Julian kind of tourist hubs in the city. Any questions or anything so far? Okay, so we've got a couple partnerships with the Hill Hotels that we're looking forward to. Uh, we've got three conversations on the books for January and February. Uh, the first being alley improvements. We're hoping that the Hill Hotel developers will be able to uh, pitch in some money to help with specifically the alley that's going to run right into the Hill Hotel. So the alley behind the Fox and behind uh, Cafe Ion. Second project is cohesive uh, wayfinding signage. So we're trying to work with downtown Boulder and the city to make sure that signs put up around the hill around the two hotel sites uh, will be cohesive with the ones that are down on the Pearl Street district uh, and will help you know tourists and non-tourists find their way around the district. Uh, the third project is the 13th Street Creek Path connection, which we've heard a lot about um, but haven't been involved uh, in the conversation yet. So we're looking forward to, you know, getting involved with that and understand more about what that'll mean for the Hill to have that new bike path, pedestrian path connection. Last thing I wanna give an update on is our 2023 work plan uh, with the ARPA funds that we've received. So first we'll continue district marketing, uh, which includes our website, social media, blog, and uh, public newsletters. We will continue our business support and retention efforts. That includes our business newsletter, our uh, resource pages for businesses on our website, and one-on-one -on -one outreach to existing potential and uh, outgoing businesses on the Hill. Third, community partnerships and outreach. Uh, so we'll do, we'll be working with Jennifer Pinsano to do some surveying uh, and more collaboration with downtown Boulder and other groups. And finally, we'll be looking for other funding sources for the Hill Boulder, including potentially moving to a paid membership model for the Hill, for the Hill Boulder, uh, which would offer businesses more benefits from uh, if they, if they uh, agree to be part of a paid membership program. So those are my updates. Any questions, any comments? The new website looks great. It's much nicer. I'm gonna, I'll share my screen if you haven't seen it. I'll share the share screen just so Thank you. Can... That's great, Chris. Jake, do you um, have thoughts on events through the summer months? Um, not currently, uh, but I am hoping to so i'm going to apply for an arts and culture grant uh and that so i, I haven't come up with a plan for that yet but i hope that and, we can get some money and, and host some events yes okay Go ahead. oh and i assume there will probably be some further discussion with both matt and justin who are on the call um with some of those funds that we've identified to be able to promote um, through ARPA, different activations, including areas on the hill. So definitely we'll be more information forthcoming on that. Jake, um, the illustrated map, is that going to be something that's like an annual effort or it, it, it would seem that it will be updated from time to time? So what's the plan there? Correct. Yeah, we will have to update it. Um, it's primarily supposed to be kind of pedestrian wayfinding, less about, you know, this exact business is in this exact location, um, more about you're on this corner, this is how you get towards, you know, the district, this is how you get towards Chautauqua, this is how you get towards Pearl Street, um, but it will have businesses labeled and I, uh, we have an agreement with the artist 
uh, again, who's a CU architecture student that we can come back to her for updates um, for a very low, low cost and do, yeah, we'll probably do annual or biannual updates to that. Thank you. Jake, have you had any um, property owners engage through the Hill Boulder? And uh, so I've gotten some email engagement for sure. Um, I don't, I would say we don't get a lot of um, engagement other than that, but I, I do, I do exchange emails with some property owners from time to time, but our, it would seem that kind of our, our base skews more towards business owners in terms of who's engaging. Okay. This is all really helpful. Thanks, Jake. Thank you, Jake. Such awesome work. I'm really excited about the website. Yeah, so it looks great. Really a step um, in a positive direction. I did want to mention one additional thing um, in the partnership with, with Downtown Boulder is the ambassador program. We have approached uh, CU uh, asking them for additional resources to support expansion of the ambassadors on the Hill. They've in turn suggested that they might be willing to contribute even more than what we'd approach them um, to maybe expand um, ambassadors into the um, evening hours um, for uh, nighttime safety um, improvements. We'll see how they respond to that proposal, but at the very least, we're hopeful that they will certainly contribute to an expansion of the, the regular ambassador program. So you'll be able to hopefully in the not too distant future see additional um, and the ambassador activity on the Hill. Would the, would that would be great. I've... Students? Say again? Would students be part of the ambassador program or just the, the ambassador program as it is now? with hiring more people hiring more people that would yeah be that would be great i was just gonna add that I, I have heard that the hill businesses aren't seeing a huge ambassador presence um or at least i'd say i've i've spoken with or i've emailed with maybe five or so business owners who weren't aware that the ambassadors even came to the hill so I think that would be great. Probably later hours would mean more, you know, restaurants are seeing them actually up there on the hill. Great. All right. Any more questions for Jake? Thanks, Jake. Sure. All right. Um, Teresa, do you have anything more you want to share on 14th Street outside the VOLA? I think at this time, I think. We'll be looking forward to our kickoff meeting with ULI, getting that process moving forward. Yeah, so the March meeting, we'll have a, a meter update. And and Andrew, welcome. I don't know if you were uh, listening in when I announced we did receive the ULI TAP grant. We just heard today. Um, and so we will be working with the Urban Land Institute in this uh, conversation around uh, reimagining the 14th Street lot and how that fits with the broader context of other transformations on the Hill. So looking forward to sharing more with you all in March. And not related to um, 14th Street, but projects on the Hill. Um, we did successfully complete the first, I guess I'll call it phase one of the landscaping project. And so all of that work's been complete. And so we'll be coming back in the spring to actually plant the trees, but it's a big success to get that all taken care of. And we'll look forward to getting some nice plants, shrubs and things around um, probably in about the April, May timeframe. And we have on here the Hill Hotel timeline update. I know we heard a little bit from Jake. I'm not sure. If I didn't. I don't know that I put that on the agenda. I want to make sure if there's anything else that we wanted to share on that. I think during our agenda setting meeting, that was a request to just continue to get updates. Um, seems to be moving along and I don't know that are, are we still looking at uh, the end of 2023 beginning of 2024 as Q1 2024 yeah. as as an opening I know that there's been a delay I see Jake turned his his camera I'm not sure if you have more context on where what they're anticipating but I know the project originally was anticipated for end of 2023 and then but to, yeah. it's now been delayed into 2024 yeah that's correct so the hill hotel was delayed till i think spring 2024 is the new estimate 
Um, and then I did want to point out that in our, on our new website, if you go to the features uh, tab, the features section, that's kind of like our blog posts. Um, there's a there's a little article there about with the the most up to date timeline and links and photos and stuff of of both hotel projects. Great, and I've been hearing that uh, CU is anticipating groundbreaking this month. Um, we'll see if that actually happens for the the conference center with the completion date in 2025. Do we know anything more about the corridor? I, I got wind that something that was fits and it gotten changed because of the, we had some concerns about the traffic flow and about the pedestrian flow and all that. Sure, so that is all, so the, the conference center is going to be kept separate from the conversation around connections from the downtown to the conference center into the hill. So that's going to continue. And, and there are a lot of city departments that are involved in that conversation um, and the university as well. So I know that uh, it's, it's certainly a priority for many. Um, and so as soon as there's work in that realm, I'll make, I will certainly make sure that you all are included in the touch points along the way, because there's a lot of folks that are really interested in that particular topic. All right, well, that concludes uh, matters from staff. We have um, a couple items that we listed on matters from commissioners based on the joint agenda setting meeting. So I think a check-in on um, how we've described the 2023 priorities, as well as an exploration of alternative revenue streams. That's a topic that came up at the retreat. I think the priorities that we talked about are not um, are just a little more targeted than the priorities from 2022. I do think that an urgent priority for 2023 is, unfortunately, it's that um, that piece of the alleyway that connects the, the front entrance of the Hill Hotel um, to the event street. And I know that the property owner um, for the Aeon building is interested in joining the conversation there. But from what I understand, there, there are no dollars that um, that can be contributed from the city to make any improvements in that, that alleyway, that one specific section of that alley. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that there are no funds. I think it's a prayer where we have, we have resources. Um, we spent a chunk of change on the landscaping right. um, and we could always approach city council you know, if we have a plan, um, I think that I would probably point to the ULI. That process is our next step to envision where, what are our highest priorities for investment on the Hill, um, uh, probably in addition to 14th Street. And, um, and if this rises to the top of that in that conversation, then understanding of what the, you know, what is the investment and whether it needs to come from the district. I mean, the city builds stuff all the time, right? Um, it, it helps if there is a dedicated fund. I know that in the conversation around these topics back in 2014, 2015, there was the concept of a downtown development authority. So using you know, tax increment financing possibilities, especially in light of that we're anticipating property values are gonna go up on the hill with the new hotel, with the conference center. Um, it does, the, the concept of a downtown development authority um, could be a financing mechanism that allows us to do things like alley improvements or whatever the top priorities are. I think even envisioning what is needed to make it enticing is a start of the conversation. 
Um, and the, the process for that and, and what we're able, you know, what as a district we're able to consider, what we're not able to consider. But I think getting creative in what's going to be um, fresh and enticing in that, in that area. Um, what are the restrictions that, you know, we shouldn't even consider? Yeah. Because I, I don't know the answer to that question. When, Obviously, we'd love to have, um, you know, a, a walkable space that's not potholed and all of that, but that is the domain of the city. Um, well, and it is it is public right of way. However, transportation and mobility tends to not do any alley maintenance. We do have nicer alleys in the downtown and in the University of as bad as some of them are, um, because there have been investments from, um, you know, through uh, capital investments from the district or uh, bonding initiatives that said, you know, these alleys should be maintained at a higher level um, uh, for these right reasons. And this is not the first time we've talked about this particular alley. We do have the, the alleyway um, the alley plan. plan. Yeah, so it's certainly, know that, that um, Regan and Teresa's team are aware of that plan. And so I, I'd say that that should be an informing document to this next conversation we're having with the TAP uh, grant work. Um, that among others, like the reinvestment strategy from 2015, that should be an informing document. So we're not starting from scratch. We've done so much of this. We've had these conversations before, right? right. And there have, have been improvements you, to that alley. Have you... Um, have you guys laid eyes on the alley improvement? Oh, the, the actual plan. The plan. I want to say that there was in a packet about a year ago. We had like an overview of some of those plans. Yeah, I don't think I ever saw that. anything concrete. Yeah. yeah. But Jake had also just mentioned right that the hotel possibly has interest. I think unless I misheard, Jake. How do how do those things become personal asset? That's a really good question. I know that's, where, that's that what I'm struggling. Here. So the city does not have a good mechanism for private parties to invest in public infrastructure, um, and part of that is philosophical in the sense of should wealthy neighborhoods be able to uh, pool their funds and make you know have a nicer park than other parts of the city because they have access to resources that they can pull together and, and make those things happen. So that's, it's certainly, it's a, it's a topic that's come up before in different contexts. Um, that said, there are other mechanisms like a, a, a general obligation bond for like, if we're doing a citywide uh, capital bond um, program where we're doing capital improvements in all areas of the city, alleyway improvements certainly could and, and theoretically should be a part of that conversation. And that could be a place where something like that could fit. Or alternatively, if there are dedicated funding sources like a downtown development authority where, where there is you know, a, a general agreement that this area is gonna have um, uh, a specific funding source to do things like alley improvements or other capital projects, then that, then that would be a good fit. Is there a way to understand where the public right of way in terms of you know space where the public right of way ends and how much is it five feet six feet um, that goes into private property where we can engage property owners to do I don't know greenery sculptures or art or or something that um, can that can be done without um, without the you know city, the city, having, city, to be the, the, the city, yeah. city yeah. having to be involved um, where we can figure out some creative solutions um, while we're trying to get the alley improved. My biggest fear is that it's going to look the way it looks now when the hotel opens and time is ticking and 
what kind of document is there that lets us know if we have any ground to work with? Um, that is something other than a mural, because we're we're pretty muraled out, I think. <laughs> and something a little different would be really nice. So we do have Matt Chazansky on the call. I'm not. And this is certainly not a new topic for us. And I too am muraled out. Um, so is any Matt, Matt, Matt will never be muraled out. Yeah, no, the no. problems are bigger than a mural. Yeah, the the mural than a mural. Yeah, it is. The problems yeah. are way bigger than a mural can solve. Right. Agreed. But how do we find out? Back to my original question, is there is there a, a is it going to find a location certificate for every property to figure out where public right of way starts? Well, there's there's a standard alley of right of way, so the, it's not like the the line is jagged okay. behind those properties. It's a straight line. Um, it's the same with um, um, nice. and all it. it Find you know albums and that's weird because it's a diagonal a alleyway, so that one's animal. a little bit weirder and harder to know exactly where it is. But but next to Al's, I mean that that it's building goes right up to the property line, and then however wide the alleyway is, it's a straight shot. Um, everything else is is private property. Of course, then there's land use considerations that uh, other departments have uh, uh, interests in what happens on. Uh, uh, private property and how that's developed it doesn't mean that we can't get across, get over those hurdles. Well, I mean, yeah, even understanding what those hurdles are is probably a, a, before we get, you know, get our creative juices flowing. So, so oh, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to mention, you know, we've uh, been working to streamline the process for proposing works of public art. Um, you know, if, if there is actual private property space, then that's a, a different matter altogether. But for the public right of way, we, we do have a process and we can pretty succinctly get the area and the dimensions and and a process together with the Boulder Arts Commission to, um, in, you know, install what would essentially be donated works of art in those in those spaces. So the first step I'd say is we'll plan to resurrect the alleyway plan as part of this broader conversation for the ULA and TAP work. We want to make sure that all this previous work is not lost and we're not starting from scratch in these conversations um, so that we can then use that process to prioritize what are the most important projects that we should be pursuing um, and some really round dollar amounts um, associated with those projects so that we can start planning about how do we how do we get them done. So I don't envision that we're going to be rebuilding the alleyway um, for the end of 2023, but um, it's quite possible that this process could lead to um, some capital um, investment by 2024. We'll plan to make sure that that doesn't that we continue to bring that convert that part of the broader conversation forward um, in this broader uh, work. Yeah, I, I would echo some of what Cheryl's saying there, particularly knowing that what Jake just shared around having a new partner in the Hill, you know, develop those whoever who's what's the name of that development company um, who's going to be managing it. I think, well, I think it's called the Hill Partners. The Hill right Partners. Now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're new partners. And if they're interested in helping make sure that that entryway to their property is up to snuff, it'd be great to help them understand what are the hurdles involved and what can and can't be done so that they don't get frustrated right out of the gate. And then we've lost them. We've lost them maybe you know, for a while. Um, if we have the opportunity, let's let's make, make it as easy as we can to give them a kind of a punch list. Of, this is what we can do in the short term. Um, and this is what we're, we're working on for like a longer term engagement. Yeah, even the big cement flower pots that maybe the city has in their, um, in their uh, you know, 
that are not being currently used. Um, and flowers are, can cover up a lot. You know, flowers and greenery can cover up a lot. And even if it's as simple as flowery walkway with some, some of the resources that already exist that aren't being used. We could, I know watering the pots becomes an issue, but we can um, figure out a solution to that. Art would be great, but. Um, well, making it walkable is a whole other thing. I mean, that's. Yeah. That's like that's along mark. the lines of a capital improvement potentially. Mm -hmm. The alley that's next to Owls and behind Afast will come on it. Um, <laughs> is um, I think a little bit better shape than the one that's behind the Fox. That that alley is practically unwalkable in the summertime, <laughs> let alone in the winter. But um, so that that would probably likely be more of a, a longer term project. But that initial alleyway right there, right near the hotel, I think is low-hanging fruit for easier improvement and then you know maybe facilitating a partnership that continues in the future with the hotel. So I'm certainly hearing that as a theme of, of priorities. <laughs> That's a priority. But, yeah. And but maybe I would I would offer that it should not necessarily be focused in on alleyway, but hotel pedestrian connections. Yes. I think the the um, continuing to foster a productive relationship with CU um, remains on the priority list. Andrew, did you, um, when you looked at the priority conversation in the packet, did you, uh, did anything jump out at you as something that's um, missing? I did first my apologies for being late. Um, but um, you know, the one thing that that um and, and I'm not on the hill nearly as much as as uh, some of you, but um but whether we, you know, clean up the alley, you know, do something with the alleys, which I'm of course all for, or 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 whatever uh we do, it seems like um neglect and um and uh you know, just inability to clean and just basic services um, defeat whatever um, whatever we do in part and degrade what we've got. And if we're worried about making a good impression when, you know, when the hotel opens um, and making the place inviting to the public is, and obviously it's a funding issue in part for us, you know, cleaning the sidewalks and whatnot. But is there something there that needs to be a priority to make sure that the hill is clean and inviting as opposed to just capital improvements? I think where that landed was, you know, funding sources, right? Um, The diversify revenue streams, number five there. Engage with city staff to help with issues on the Hill and diversify revenue streams. Um, is, is there any, uh, you know, Chris, I, I throw this out to you, but given the, given the state of affairs and obviously concerns about the Hill, I mean, I can tell you in, in the other groups that I'm in, the students are very upset about the safety issues and part of it's just, you know, that it all, it's all ties together, right? Um, it is, um, you know, with this hotel coming up, is there any, even though we've got these funding issues with the city, is just uh, these basic services, is that something where we can make a plea or a request and maybe I'm out of order here in terms of what what question was asked of me, but but is there any way to sort of front and center that and say, you know, at least for the time being, we understand that we're in a wait and see approach and let's see what happens with the revenue from the hotel. And we, you know, we've we're we're exploring other funding options and 
And a lot of that is a remain to be seen. I feel like we're treading water, right? Until the, you talk to the guys that, you know, you talk to CU and they say, well, it's all going to be good when the conference center and the hotel are in. Uh, it's all going to work. It's all going to work itself out. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people feel that way, but we're treading water until then. And we, um, and so the question is, is there any way to get us some water wings uh, to help us out while we're treading water? So thanks for the question. I'd say that it's certainly been part of our conversation, for instance, and I don't know if you were here when I was discussing, I think you were, yeah, the support from CU for more ambassador presence on that. The ambassadors do sidewalk cleaning. They do um, some basic maintenance. It's not, it's not what we need. It's not the level at which we need it, um, but we're trying to spread the resources as far as we possibly can. Um, and it, again, I think it, as Cheryl was indicating, the, the, the conversation is more about these revenue streams. When you think about the, the 1.7 mils, what is our what was our revenue or our anticipated revenue this year? 30, $34,000. $34, in the, in the grand scheme of of this this realm of work, that that does not get you very far in uh, the things that we're talking about here. We certainly do approach city council and and um, continue to be successful in arguing for uh, general fund transfer. We're hoping to get uh, proposed additional uh, transfer um, in 2024 because. Uh, parking revenues are returning. We do tie that ask to the parking dollars that are coming in on street. Those are general fund revenues, but but since they are in the district, we do uh, look to those as well. Um, the issue also is that we have this money sitting in the bank and it's only going to go so far. And so this it's more about the priority. We've spent a little bit of money on this landscaping project that has helped make it look a little bit better. Um, around 13th and Pennsylvania. We have um, significant priority and, and uh, magnifying glass on 14th Street, and we want to make that as successful as possible. We have, we, the landscaping work was originally designed to be all of 13th Street from college to Pennsylvania, and the money just is not going as far as it used to. So I'd say that you know, the challenge is there's no lack of things that we know we, we think we should be working on to make sure that the hill can be as successful as possible. But our appetite it continues to be a lot bigger than our stomach when it comes to um, how to pay for these things. We do have some money. We are continuing to seek um, additional support and other monies. Um, but as you said, Andrew, that it's one thing to contemplate a capital project, but then you got to maintain the thing. And so uh, I'd say we already have challenges with some of the capital improvements actually on 13th Street, let alone uh, adding the alleyways to that. I'm not saying it's impossible. I think that it's what well, this next conversation is more around how to really prioritize all of these needs um, and get a complete dollar amount, right? What's the, what is the total cost, not just for um, some sort of alley project between uh, Pleasant and Pennsylvania, what is the total round dollar amount for all of the priorities and things that we think are important on the Hill? It's not just build them, but also maintain them in perpetuity. What is that dollar amount? And then be working towards that, that dollar amount. And that's really the conversation we want to be having as part of this imagining what's next for the, the South Anchor of 14th Street of pulling all these different ideas and priorities together, um, uh, then deciding what's our roadmap or and timeline for taking the steps. We're not going to do them all at once, um, but we, we need to start somewhere. Well, and I don't, I don't think our priorities and capital improvement requests have changed in the past four years. They've all been, we need to be cleaner, we need to be safer, and we need to prepare for, um, to look good for when the hotel opens. So um, I, I, I think we're all, we've all said those are priorities ad nauseum over the past number of years. Um, 
I will say that um, when we have seen greater activity and improvement on the hill, there was engagement with the hill boulder. Um, we had um, someone working with us, at, you know, Saturday mornings out there planting pots and planting the exit, the, uh, the, the greenery where people come under the tunnel, um, cleanups, all of that. And Jake, maybe we can figure out a way to get, um, get the stakeholders mobilized again this spring to, to bring some of those activities back. The, um, the fraternity folks, the sorority folks, um, it sounds like we, we need to mobilize um, the district and the stakeholders in the district um, in tandem with what assistance we can get from the city in order to make a difference in the district in time for um, new visitors and new businesses, hopefully to, to want to be on the hill. There's a real opportunity beyond the hill too, um, because we're hearing that athletics has turned a particular corner. Um, you know, we're we're hearing of um, season ticket, you know, season tickets being sold at a rate that haven't been sold in 20, 30 years. And so, where will people go on their way to the game, game or after the game? They're going to be up on the hill. And so, there's a real opportunity here to leverage um, traffic from the dead and company stuff that's happening in July, and then also moving towards excitement in the fall. Um, and so that I, I agree with you. There may be a constituency kind of groundswell that we can take advantage of as well. So it's not just all on the backs of, well, hey, City Boulder solved this problem entirely. Um. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd say that, again, this process and this conversation about leveling the playing field for this commercial district relative to other commercial districts there is a role of the city in that conversation of is now the right time to, to um, um, rethink some of those uh, restrictions and can we incorporate that into the process? And that is very much the work of the city yeah, yeah. Um, and something that I, I know we wanna make. And that will help, right? If, if we're able to remove some of those barriers for folks who wanna take the risk to take advantage of a new era of, of sports fandom in Boulder, and make that happen on the hill. Um, the yeah, and the condition of the albums on the hill building, I don't see changing in the next year. Um, so depending on how quickly we can move with, maybe that is a number one priority um, to get those uh, layered restrictions removed. Is, is there a, I, because yeah. Pete will go into that space. But that was the question. I mean, do we, he, can we talk to him and find I, out what I mean, the problems were? I mean, it sounds like well, we have two different you have to the you have to well, I understand the licensing, the liquor license. The building's in really bad shape. I mean, I'm happy to call Pete and talk with him. Are there other things we should be, I mean, to, to, um, to Ted's point, um, it, it, with the expectation that those, you know, again, that's a, this is a, a fall away, but um, with that uh, significant increased traffic, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we're gonna lose all those people just down to Pearl Street, right? I mean, we only have so much capacity right now with the, with the, um, you know, with the sink and Cafe Aeon and the corner and other other spots, um, you know, and, and people are not going to build yet until those hotels come, people are not going to take risks probably yet. It's early. Rosenberg's is a good example, right? They came, they came too early. And um, and so, but is there a way to take up the slack on those big game weekends? And, and I don't know if that tax revenue, well, let me just throw out an idea, whether it's food carts or some other way to activate the, um, the, uh, the event street and 
assuming that all those revenues will come to the district then from a tax standpoint, I don't know if they do or they don't know how that works from a sales standpoint, if it's temporary. Uh, but anyway, should we be exploring those kinds of things as stopgap measures until we have a more firm, diverse anchor set of anchors on the Hill? One of the things that I brought up, Andrew, I think in our last meeting was, would the city be willing? I know that the admission tax um, goes to the general fund, right? Because the occupation tax goes to the CVB or Visit Boulder or whatever, that funds those activities. But if, say, the only place on the hill that generates admission tax is the Fox, is there a way to temporarily divert admission tax to add a couple more street cleanings or, you know, something like that, especially before the dead and company weekend, because right now there's only two street cleanings a year that are in the budget. And one is before graduation and one is before um, homecoming. Um, but we, we need more than that. And I'm not even sure that those actually happened last week. Um, I mean, last, last year, because I just hired a private company to do us and boss ladies because it was just so disgusting. Um, but I, I don't know who would we appeal to for a temporary two, three year diversion of admission tax from the general fund to go into the UGID, um, because sales tax doesn't come to us. And can you clarify for me when, when the hotel is built and I'm getting all the various stages of the Hill Hotel funding city thing, the mill levy, it, that's not going back to, to repay any loans from the city anymore because there was no loan. So the mill levy is now going into the district in a way that the original conversation did not have the mill levy going into the district, right? I wasn't part of those original conversations, but originally there was going to be a parking structure, city-owned parking structure component to the project that would have translated into some debt service. Um, and so since there was no parking garage uh, included in the project, then yes, it's my understanding that, that um, yeah, there there is no. So we will we goes. will see an an increase in district funding through that property tax. You know, is is there a temporary diversion with a payback down down the road so that we can get the district looking a little better? I know it's not probably a big amount of money, but. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm just yeah, trying to yeah. think creatively about that. There is, I mean, that is what the district has created, right, is leverage um, anticipated revenues to pursue a capital project that could, you know, back in 1970, it included purchasing some parcels to provide parking. Right? Where, where does the capital... Uh, Project. What what dollar amount makes it a capital improvement? Is does the city have a set? It's it's not necessarily a dollar amount, but yeah. I mean, typically it's going to be over fifty thousand, and that's what triggers the formal procurement process. I was just curious. But the challenge is that over time, right? As you build something, you use dollars to build something, and then you have to maintain that something, and. Um, so it's one thing to have a you know, pass a mill levy and you don't own anything yet. You pass a mill levy, you know, leverage those dollars, you bond against them to build something or buy something, and now you have to maintain that something. And so this is the challenge of if we issue debt, 
uh, against well, you just the don't issue debt to the level of the anticipated revenue. But, you but, know, there's got to be right. Our anticipated revenue in the district right now is is almost nothing, and we we have an asset that we need to maintain, and we are talking about leveraging the the resources that we have accumulated over the past fifty years to build something big um, at Fourteenth Street. And if that's if that's a top priority of the use of those dollars, then we need to be really thoughtful and careful. We're not going to necessarily find ourselves in a space where we have any capacity in the existing mill levy to issue debt against. Say the admission tax, we want to borrow back from the general fund $25,000, and it gets us three more street cleanings. Um, we're not, I'm not. I mean, I'm not talking about 14th yeah. Street million. I'm talking about low level. I would say, you know, when it comes to that level of, I mean, we're a half a billion dollar a year corporation I when know, you think about it. So just trying to get our finance department stuff. Yeah, I'd say we can just, we can ask. We can go to city council and say, hey, we need to double our maintenance budget and it's going to need to come from the general fund because the district doesn't. And they, and they can say, I would yes, love they can that. say no. Would any, does, I, I mean, I think that's a good ask. It certainly it should be is, a stop along the way. It, it's a stop along the way. And I will say it would be awesome if even on the, um, you know, if we can have one central location of where all the studies, the intercept studies, the this, the that, all you have to do is look at them. If we can have them all in one place, because one of the, it's dirty, 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 dirty. And I, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but um, if we, because our biggest concern is people will not want to come to the Hill once we build it, they may not come. Um, and so we're, we're desperately trying to get ahead of that, which we can all see coming as clear as day. I, and I found. Yeah, and I hear you. And I, I do, certainly not falling on deaf ears. And I would, though, also offer that there have been incremental improvements over time between um, the lighting that's not working, right? The lighting that's not working. The lighting not working. The, 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 the dirty and the, the business. consolidated business. trash enclosure. I'd say that, that was a pilot program. Yeah. So that, have, that is the, the improvement that we got behind that alley. Um, and, and there have there have been joint efforts um, by property owners and businesses and um, you know I everything doesn't I, I'm hoping that everything doesn't have to be um, at, at an ask that's at such a high level that it you know that we can't get there. Um, so we're talking about a business that doesn't want to expand in a way that makes total sense and can impact the vibrancy that's already there. And they won't do it because of the layered restrictions, the only layered restrictions in the entire state um, on a very small district. Um, we do see improvement with CU and, and that's, you know, that's always going to be a priority. They're our neighbor and what they do impacts us. Um, you know, I'm just not sure where to go other than to um, ask for ways that we can creatively impact, you know, one of the things that's the biggest issue in the district. It's made mention before that, you know, CU, obviously we're talking about the investor program and then wanting to go somewhat above and beyond. I mean, they have a, sounds like the student reaction right now is also very negative to the Hill. Um, does that go into the same realm of taking care of an alley or can, can there be a component from the CU side of maintenance, cleaning, if it's not that much money? Right, again, just being creative on it. I mean, of course the city, it's the city's 
three students should be safe and clean for everybody. But the students also have a very vested interest, or see you as a vested interest in, in the district being clean and safe. And you yeah, know, but it's not like they're going to take money out of their budget and put it into the city's budget. That's going to go. No, that's what I'm asking. But is there? But can they pay for know. a couple of companies? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the intricacies of how all this works. I'm still trying to kind of figure out the, the difference point, between we asked the, the city two. if we could take the cleaning budget and out of out of um, and and move it into the Hill Boulder and have it managed and um, by the Hill Boulder based on what we saw on the streets and when and how, um, or if it could be a privatized in, in some respect with the money that's in the budget. But I don't think that that was a workable solution. And that is going back probably eight years ago when we started talking about that. I don't know, Andrew, if you recall any of those conversations about how to take you know, that budget and see if we can um, uh, through the hill boulder stretch it a little further. And I don't want to get completely off track because I know that we have one more agenda item. So what is it about 520? Yes. Um, Although they've kind of been combined, but so I have some, I, have, I wasn't part of those conversations. I have some, um, Voices in my head that are telling me why that was probably a non-starter back, you know, eight years ago. There are certainly some some possibilities that we're already doing it a little bit with the ambassador program, and the world has changed a bit um, uh, in some uh, realms since that was maybe broached. And so um, we can certainly explore that again. Wasn't there a street? cleaning machine that was stored somewhere that was available for that purpose. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah, we, we had, we yeah, used to go back to Sarah, Sarah's uh, uh, endeavors on the hill. One we did at one time, yeah, we rented space from four mm -hmm. star properties right, and had stuff right. in there and that's, yeah, we don't have that space anymore. So I'm not, okay. yeah. So we have a lot of headwinds in terms of bureaucracy, in terms of um, brand issues with what the Hill represents to the public that uses that area. Students in particular now, we've lost them too in the last couple of years. And it seems to me that what, what we need is a certain amount of creative thinking along with some political will to be able to do some things. Um, what we're talking about, you know, what Cheryl's kind of presenting there is like, can we borrow against ourselves in order to do something so that when um, we have the opportunity that we know is coming to have new visitors see the hill and enact with the hill in a way that isn't what the current state is, um, what would that look like? I think many of these conversations are kind of hinge on a relationship with, with council. I think a lot of what we're talking about here could be really helped by having council understand what these issues are and understand how urgent they are. Um, and one of our priorities in 22, I think, was trying to improve council relationships. I think we made some progress on that. There's a lot more progress that can be made there. And I'm wondering out loud for all of us to kind of ponder and maybe even discuss what can we do to do that? How, how do we get Council understanding the urgency of the issues on the Hill and why this can't just be kicked down the, the road another year uh, or even six months, frankly. We, we need to be moving on this sooner so that we can actually hit the iron when it's hot in late summer and fall as we turn the corner towards this hotel over there. Hey, Andrew. So if, if you... <clears throat> If you wanted to make an impact on council and really, I mean, we've tried to get them up for tours and that's worked to some of it, you know, the, the neighborhood stuff has, Frank, Frank, I think the last time we had it up, they cleaned right before they came. So they, uh, the place looked really nice. It was, <laughs> everybody was shocked. And uh, 
the most important the most important thing you could do is take video footage of stuff that we don't like uh, and have people sign up to speak at city council meetings every every uh, every city council meeting show a little bit of footage explain the problem and do it over and over again for about six weeks in a row and it will be front and center on their mind that is the most important thing you could do do you do you agree Andrew with what I'm talking about there or am I missing how Absolutely. important that would be if, yeah. if, if if they were to see, the state of affairs and hear from people who are there. And if we could enlist students uh, yeah. and, uh, and have various people, not just the same faces show up and say, uh, I'm concerned about my safety. I'm concerned about health and welfare. I'm concerned about, um, about appearances. This is a really important time for the university has made an investment in a football program. Uh, we've made investments in hotels. We've made investments on reinvigorating the hill and then someone uh, to come in from time to time and explain the economics of the district right now. There is nothing we could, the, the, no phone call to any uh, city council member would be as impactful as doing that over and over again, um, several, um, several months in a row. Because it's not just the city council, it's the public. And they see the city council hearing the message and all of a sudden people all start to get it. So I would suggest that that's maybe not the work of an advisory commission council, but um, certainly would not uh, uh, prohibit or suggest that you shouldn't, uh, um, you know, in your own time, do what you feel like is necessary to get the attention that you need. I would suggest that staff's work plan um, for the Hill in 2023 is, by my estimation, pretty aggressive. We were so delighted to have gotten this TAP grant. Work is going to be beginning, going to be beginning imminently on that. Um, and we'll be providing you all with an opportunity to both influence, inform, um, and then uh, recommend to council top priorities of that work that can include a lot of the things that we've been discussing today. And that will be going to council. Um, let and me we'll ask Chris, I, in the process. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but, uh, and I understand the idea, I mean, you know, of, of you know, what, what's in UCAMC's role and, and not, but, and obviously the Hill Boulder, for example, could uh, do a lot of the coordinating that I, for the things I just described. But nonetheless, if that, if, if some private group were to develop that, um, that coordinated effort. Do you see any problem with uh, UKMC sending someone to speak to city council, uh, especially if we voted to do that to, uh, you know, you're going to have, you, you might be different messages heard from different folks, but we have a very specific message and why we couldn't deliver that message. Um, in a very respectful and uh, as it, I'm sure it would be. Uh, and concise uh, and professional manner. Sure, I'd say that you know there there are um, there is ordinance language around what the purpose of UCAMC is, and clean and safe is a part of that, um, and that is the work that that staff is being charged to help support with a very limited amount of dollars, and so more dollars would help, um, and you. Know, I would say that the work of the Hill Boulder, similarly to the work of Downtown Boulder Partnership, that is an that's an advocacy organization, and they get to um, lobby uh, council based on their priorities and what they think needs to happen, and try to sway um, uh, the decision making process to make those things happen. And staff is not able to be in that space. And I'd say that as an appointed commissioner on an advisory panel, it's a it's a delicate dance to to balance um, and staff is here to support you all in the way that we can to, to fulfill the, the purpose of the district and the, the commission. Um, and, but it's gonna be really important for us to make sure that we're maintaining appropriate boundaries in um, what is the work of the city, 
what is the function of the district and, and the resources that it is able to provide to us in fulfilling our role. And if there is an outside energy that says there needs to be a lot more uh, attention on the Hill, and that means that council's going to turn around and give staff more money to do more stuff and hire more people because eventually it gets to, uh, you know, not just a cash resource, it's a, it's a people resource to, to make these things happen, then so be it. Um, but we have our processes that we need to go through and we hear you and we're going to make sure that, that uh, we will use the tools that we have available to us to, to increase resources and plan for um, these investments. Um, but if that's not fast enough, which is that's kind of what I'm hearing is we have our staff uh, work plan that we're trying to be responsive to the what we hear from the, the well, that's commission. Long range, we're trying to short range for us is in the next fourteen months. So we're that's kind of the space we're um, concerned about. I think. Let me let me ask you this. Do we, in this meeting, we should be clarifying priorities for you um, to, to send to city council, correct. correct? So I think that we've had a lot of discussion. Do we want to clarify for Chris what the priorities are that we're recommending after after this conversation mm -hmm. to get that piece of work done. Yes. So um, I'd like to ask the commissioners, Andrew, what what might be your top priorities? I, I mean, I guess the question is how granular you, you want to be, but my sense is we could ask for all, we have, we have lots of priorities, lots of concerns, but the thing that will resonate the most right now, and the thing that is the most powerful and is probably the most pressing concern is improving the, um, the safety and aesthetic appearance of the hill in the short term. And, um, and that may be too broad in general, uh, and maybe we need specific items. But I mean, if someone were to ask me what the hit, what my priority would be, that's what it would be. And if city council member asked me, I would say that, and I think that would resonate more with them than saying, well, we'd like to spend some money on, you know, on an alley improvement, which, or something else, which I think is huge. Uh, but, um, but it's sort of first things first, right? And, and I think broad going, is good. Yeah. And I, and I do think that they're going to think in this time of, um, we've already heard this, right? If we're, if we're short on money and we're asking council for money, uh, they are, um, uh, they're going to say, well, that's, uh, you know, if you're asking for a bell and whistle, that's really nice or what they perceive as a bell and whistle. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the most basic function of government. And, and that's what we need on the Hill right now. And, um, you know, and I, they're probably hearing this from many different quarters, but um, I think they've just discovered $9 million or whatever from the library. And so, uh, uh, you know, help, help, help us out a little bit. Well, and I think that the work exploring um, day shelters and, and things like that is, is great. Uh, a great use of some resources too. So safety and cleanliness. I, I think close, I, I totally agree with what Andrew was just saying. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think broad is. I think the second one is economic vitality generally. We've, we've seen too many businesses go out of business this last year. And along the lines of what we were talking about specifically around peds, around illegal peds and that expansion, what can be done on that? What can we be doing to help the Hill be a place that will be appetizing to new business? And there are some easy things that we could put out there. The, the layered 
regulations that are, are currently in play on the Hill are an easy one to throw out there to at least have a discussion about. That's an actionable item yeah. that can really make a huge impact on economic vitality because it will be easier to attract businesses. So I, I would say that to me is priority number two and it's actionable. Yeah, they could change that right away if they, you know. I mean, know. I don't know the process to change that and I don't know if it's right away, but if it can be done in the space of, you know. It can be. If, if council wants to take it on. Um, and it still is, I mean, we could place people want to be, maybe those people can do something with pretty reasonable. Safety and cleanliness, yeah. economic vitality, and um, I, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. You were to me, I was just going to say continued engagement with and further the relationship with CU. Yeah, I, I think that the grant that that you all were just awarded, that we were awarded, is really important, and it's a part. It's layered into each one of those priorities. I don't know if it makes sense to make that. One of the priorities, like we we have this money, and we want to make sure that it's being spent, you know, in the most feasible way possible, um, because of the 14th Street possibility. You know, part of what we're talking about here is that with the Hill, but the Hill Hotel project and the conference room or the conference center project, but then also this parking lot. Like, there's this thing that can happen where there's a synergy there of multiple new economic engines for the hill. In the meantime, we need waterways like Andy was talking about. So the grant really ends up, you know, being, or I guess it's multiple grants and give us the ability to think creatively. We don't necessarily have to just imagine status quo. We may be able to try something different. And we don't want city council to not hear us because we're always asking for money that's not available. And I know in the past, it's a city council has wanted to see property owners step up and help lift up the district as well. And we don't have a great pool of property owners willing to do that. Um, we have some, um, but, you know, as far as a, a, an additional priority for city council, I, I, I can't think of anything that's more urgent than those, the top two. I think if the top two, if we can make progress on those top two in this next year, the property owners may come along. I think that there's a certain amount of goodwill here too that needs to be built for the property owners to go, okay, well, there's actually something happening. And so therefore I'll, I'll participate too. I don't know the dynamics as well as you do, but it seems like the Hill has had a lot of problems for a long time. And I could see a property owner just going, well, they don't care about it. Why am I going to invest in this? Seems like there are a bunch that won't. There's probably a number of books, right? That's right. Like, yeah. yeah. It's um otherwise yeah, it's we just have gonna some keep great falling property owners. I think that's the point. And we have some new property yeah. owners that yeah. have just joined the group. So I mean, is it possible that we just give them to the top two priorities and that will speak volumes to these are these are our two priorities instead of diluting it with additional priorities that are pretty low, low level compared to the top two. I don't know. I would say, yeah, I don't, I don't have good advice there from the staff perspective. It seems like the priorities that we're, we've identified those top two are actually relevant citywide. I mean, what we're saying there is not revolutionary. It's just that when you layer in what the hill is and what it's been through, it's urgent. It's not 
well, we need to be concerned about these things. It's something that's happening right now. Well, district vitality and then, you know, a subcategory is whether repeal is the correct word, but repeal the um, the regulatory the barriers. regulatory barriers um, and by doing that it could generate an interest in the district and because I think Andrew you're right we don't want to get too granular we don't want to keep asking for money um, that's not there. Um, but if we could figure out a way to um, have that regulation lifted, see if there's a way we can get um, or reallocate dollars to, to more safety and cleanliness um, up there. And then maybe a priority is um, well, it's not a priority for the city. Um, I think there's got to be more conversation, um, and I think it was mentioned in the in the uh, packet where you know maybe coming together a little more with the neighborhood, the university, and the commercial district, which is really outside of the responsibilities of UCAMC, but I do think it has value. Um, and I'm not sure how to work that in there as a as a priority. Maybe a broader statement uh, to that end is leverage anticipated planning processes because the COI tap grant is one of several things that are going on. The 13th Street connection is a planning process that will be happening. So leverage anticipated planning processes to highlight the hill as a major destination or something. Exhausted that one. Well, there's a lot. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I'm glad that we, it's a difficult discussion because there's so many things that could be addressed. I like the approach of staying broad with it um, because it, we could get caught up in you know, minor details. Um, Are we talking about diversifying revenues too? Is that the other thing? That's, that's the final thing. thing. That's and we've been kind of discussing that all along. I think the, um, what downtown Boulder partnership is doing, that's a little different than what the um, Hill has access to. So, it, so the Hill, and this has been talked about before, a uh, business improvement district is, an option, but it's an added property tax on an already, uh, you know, in a challenged environment. So that's something that has not been. Um, that was not popular with us. Pretty in there, so that's kind of clear now. Another topic that keeps on coming up is a downtown development uh, authority, right? That's the DDA mm -hmm. um, that allows the city within a specific defined district to leverage increases in property tax revenue uh, to really essentially be tax increment financing for capital projects uh, within the boundaries of said district. Cities in Colorado are allowed to have one defined downtown um, that could be this downtown development authority. Um, and so the question would be, if Boulder wants to pursue that funding mechanism, what is the boundary of our downtown development authority? Um, and does it, is it something that includes our traditional downtown and the hill? And the hill. Or is it something that we, we like, you know, downtown has enough money, we have agent, you know, we have an improvement district and that suffices and maybe our defined downtown in Boulder actually is this area up on the hill. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's so anyhow, but there, that is something that, that would still need to be led by 
um, the business community to say that this is what we're ready for and what we're wanting. Um, but it's that's certainly the one that I keep hearing the most about as far as uh, the, the level of potential, especially in anticipation of the property value changes. Um, and that's not just a uh, tax credit financing on the mill levy for KMC or UGIT. It's, I guess, all of the city uh, property taxes in the, in the district. So it's a new revenue source that would have, um, that would not just be tied to the UGIT mill levy, it's tied to all city um, uh, property tax revenues. Yeah, let's do that. Just make the hill the yeah, downtown area. Right. Sounds like an easy solve. <laughs> so you, but you just you borrow against anticipated revenue. Yeah, anticipated future revenues increases in in uh, property taxes to build stuff. What What's the discussion around how to define downtown? You sort of painted at the edges of that, but it seems like downtown for Boulder could be fairly wide stretch, going all the way up to Pearl to Target. And then to build a junction. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the challenge here is Boulder traditionally does not have um, tendency or desire to pursue things like tax increment financing mm. um, because it's really you're you're offering up those future revenues um, and issuing debt against them, um, and so historically our councils have not been really keen on um, that financing approach. Typically, when we've wanted to build something, we've been able to, to raise money and make it happen. So um, it's it's not something that we've seen in Boulder for quite some time. The last time we used TIF was, um, I think we did manage to do something with 29th Street, um, but it was it was not a pleasant process. But Anyhow, it's kind of like a long shot for the hill, though, doesn't it? I mean, it seems like a lot of bureaucratic stuff that's got to happen in order for that to come into play for us. Um, sure. I mean, it's certainly, yeah, it's, and it's, it needs to go to a vote of the property owners that are going to be in the district. So it has to get on the ballot and council has to prove it. I mean, there is a lot of lifting that goes into making something like that happen. But then once that boundary is established, it is a it's a dedicated funding source. I mean, you have to wait until you've paid off the debt, you know, that you uh, financed to get, but uh, financed against. But it means that in this decided boundary, this this is a funding source um, for this area as long as it exists as you as the city's DDA, whether it's just the hill or um, a, you know expansion of downtown, including the hill. So it. It's a possible funding source that a lot of communities are using. I know that um, Littleton just passed a DDA for their traditional downtown, right? They just have the, the one historic commercial center right. that's there that they're now using to, to build capital projects. And that's the thing, the key thing though, it has to build capital. It does not help with your ongoing operating. Right, right. It's got to be an asset. Yes. Are there other districts in the city that would be ripe to be considering this kind of thing? I mean, I guess that's a really naive question. I know the answer to that. But there's really not, right? It's, the well, hill's really in trouble. And the other so, uh, going older, yeah, the other conversation that, that, is, development. that keeps on coming up is reestablishing the Boulder Urban Renewal Authority. Mm -hmm. So. The hurdles to establish an urban renewal authority um, have become greater over the past several years. Um, it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. And that allows the city to designate specific areas where, again, taxing and financing can be used to support um, revitalization projects. Um, and then that's not a fixed, like a DDA is a fixed area that's established and then it's voted in where an urban renewal area, city council gets to be the executive directing board of the urban renewal authority and they get to, they get to, to move the boundaries around every so often um, once the projects are completed. Uh, so it's a different approach, but again, in Boulder, uh, historically, it's been really challenging conversation 
both the council and the community to decide that that's an approach that they want to take to pursue new funding streams for those types of projects. And then, but that said, you know, their uh, former bureau areas was all of like the 29th Street area, the Boulder Valley Regional Center was one big um, um, area that led to the uh, redo of the uh, Crossroads Mall back in the day. Um, and anyhow, precipitated a lot of uh, development at one time, but it is not a tool that Boulder has used in its toolbox for um, you know, well over 15 years. I will offer that we will certainly um, include this conversation in the ULI work because the money that we have in the bank is only going to get us so far. Um, and we'll want to make sure that we will, that we're thinking about all the different possibilities for not just 14th Street and how to use the money that we have in the bank. And how do we um, set the district up for uh, more long term success and make sure that that's part of the conversation? This type of conversation and all the work that was done in 2014 and 2015 that included conversations around the DDA and the Business Improvement District, that that all gets carried forward in this process. Where are we in the process or what, what is the process for the findings for the 14th Street lot? Where does that go next? Like as far in as terms the, of recommended, you know, recommended uses. As far as the ULI work or the work that EPS did last The work year. that EPS did. So that'll be another source of, of information for this technical advisory panel. But the really great thing is the folks who are going to be on this panel are going to be outside experts that don't have any sort of ownership or, or um, you know, biases and what they want to see happen on the Hill. Um, and they're going to take in all these different inputs and they're going to do interviews with presumably all of you, um, other property owners, community members, council members, um, and uh, they're going to develop a set of recommendations. They're going to hopefully in a really short amount of time get a uh, good understanding of all of the challenges that we've been grappling. Um, and they're going to, at least some of them, be experts in these uh, financing options and conversations, regulatory uh, considerations, right. and they'll take the recommendation from the EPS that's the highest and best use of that property that does not require city subsidy is market rate housing um, with the parking component, but there's a regulatory barrier to that right now. We are not uh, allowed to build any residential buildings on the hill um, unless they're 100% affordable, which inherently that's not, that's not going to pass it. So they are going to take that recommendation and say, if, if this is going to be the direction you want to go with development of 14th Street, here are the things that will need to happen um, in this order. And is there a timeline for all of this? Yes. And it will include a timeline uh, um, of how long they would anticipate that it would take based on their technical expertise to get from where we are today in these conversations. Um, to where uh, we want to be with that parcel and the spending of the, the dollars that we have. And I would anticipate that the panel is happening in the spring is what we had proposed. So um, probably won't happen before our March meeting. But by March, we will be able to share with you the specific dates that this is happening um, and certainly share the invites of who's part, who the panel, what the panel consists of. Uh, exactly, are. exactly. So we'll be able to share more details about specific dates of when the panel is going to happen. And then <laughs> presumably, probably by the May meeting, be able to share the results and the recommendations from the advisory panel. Which we kind of already know. 
right? Which is parking component with residential habitat. With, a, with a confirmation that top priority is remove regulatory barriers. Second priority is, you know, so I think that there, there's that's all like, there's going to be hope, presumably a lot of confirmation that we've been on the right track. Um, what this technical advisory panel can do is they can be the outside as for experts that come in and swoop in, and it's not just staff trying to, to go to council with their hat in their hand saying, that, hey, this is really important compared to all when does the moratorium sit on the residential uh, building within the commercial district? I don't know that there was any end date legislatively. Because that's another yeah. barrier that was put in place only so that the commercial area wouldn't become just a bedroom, just shut down as a commercial district. Um, yeah, I don't know that there was legislative any uh, sunset to that area. So that would on our list. Yeah, what is the question on i mean there was a I, I, it's I, I get a sense of sort of blurring two regulatory barrier issues one of them being um the types of uh you know uh liquor restrictions and and whatnot on um uh in the the core commercial district which um i think a lot of people, myself included, would be supportive of changing. Uh, it, you know, you're going to have a fight with some some neighbors on that, of course, and that's going to be an, an, an issue in itself. So, but the but the issue of it's interesting to me the the the. I apologize. So Andrew, I just want to <laughs> jump in and let everybody know we we're about two minutes yeah. shy of six o'clock. It, it's it's interesting to me though. I mean, th there was a uh, the support, and I thought it would within this group and and um, as well on the residential restriction for the for the student housing was very strong at the time, and it was it actually I mean in many ways it saved. The commercial district from a path that we that would never have gotten us to where the potential is that we have today with the hotels and whatnot. The um, th that is a that is a. I, I guess I'll just say that is a that is it. I was I can't remember whether I was on the planning board at the time or the city council at the time. There was a lot of thought put into that, and that was driven in part by the director of planning at the time of the city, uh, and. Um, and so I I don't want people to forget that there was a there was a real reason for that at the time, and that reason may still exist today, as opposed to the other regulatory res restriction we've been talking about. And I, and I guess my point is just not to blur them. Right. There's there's three with the three with the 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 liquor restriction, and then the other two would be barriers to what we know is going to be the recommendation from the well the, yeah I mean the EPS work suggested that the highest and best use of the 14th street lot is uh, residential based use um, possibly with the partnership with the property owners directly west similar to the Boyer proposal that came in many right. years ago which partially um uh, maybe that's why these uh, restrictions came through was at the time there was a very non-development friendly council um, and it was a significant uh, proposal that uh, had come in from the Boyer group. Um, and yeah, it was very anti it, it, wasn't, it wasn't from the yeah, Boyer so. group. It was from somebody that wanted to, to redo what became Walgreens. Uh, it was at the time the college bookstore. But, and, and I... And, and I wouldn't say the planning board. That's where the moratorium came from. Uh, yeah, but but um, regardless, I mean, the, look, the whole purpose of, of of the work that we've done the past five uh, plus years has been to increase diversity on the hill, and 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 the residential um, and that residential issue uh, would have had, but for the moratorium, we'd have gone the wrong way on that. Um, 
which is uh, which is you know uh, during down during non student periods of the year, they're, they're the place is a ghost town, uh, and it was it was challenging to bring. Uh, to create some diversity up here. And that's still our concern, right? Even with the hotels, the question is, are the people going to stay? Or are they going to be driven away and they're going to go down to the Pearl Street Mall? And so we want to create an atmosphere that's, that, that is um, more than just a food court atmosphere. <laughs> and so anyway, I, I, I think, and so I think it'll be important to talk to the, I mean, highest and best use is a term that, that I know very well in my practice, which just means makes the most money. Um, and so I think we have to think about what's best for the Hill. And, and I think it'll be important to talk to the ULI planners about that. But I just, I would caution us not to group all regulatory restrictions into the same bucket. I agree. Yeah, that's a good, really good point, Andrew. Um, we have exceeded our time today. Um, I think we've exhausted the conversation about diversifying revenue streams at this point, because I don't think we, we have any actionable items to move forward with at this time. So um, I'd like to move to adjourn the meeting. Second. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. We will look forward to sharing uh, more with you in March. Congratulations on the grant.